Okay, Jess. Thanks for letting me know. When you hear the border collie, bar border collie barking, you know that it's time to talk mules and donkeys. Don't ask me the history. Don't ask me how it happened. Whenever there's conversation about mules and donkeys, the Border Collie lets you know. My name's Dave. This is Steve Edwards. Every week we get together to talk mules and donkeys with you. I'm so excited that you are here today joining us. And today is a very, very special program. But before I tell you exactly what's making this program special, Mr. Steve, how has it been going since we last talked? Well, that was, uh, we've been busy, have plenty to do. Uh, I hate going into town. I had to go into town. I'd almost rather stop at the first bar and fight the biggest guy I could fight than I would <laughs> go in and deal with traffic, you know. Ah, I don't know how people, city people can do that. But anyway, <laughs> we're back home now, and uh, we're, we're raring to go. We got uh, lots to get done today. Well, folks, uh, we hope that you enjoy today's program. It's going to be a lot of fun. Before we introduce our very special guest, and you're going to want to hear this, matter of fact, last episode, the one, uh, or not last episode, but a previous episode, we had a question come in specifically about, hey, how do you plan out your water stops, your brakes, uh, food stops, all this stuff when you're doing long distance riding? And I thought, so Steve talked about it, but I thought, oh my gosh, they better listen in when this program airs because they're going to want to hear exactly uh, what our guest has to say. But before we introduce them, I want to say uh, welcome. We are so glad that you're here. Um, every week we do this. And so while this is a pre-recorded uh, interview that we've got going on today and you don't want to miss it, uh, typically we are live. And when we are live, and even today, there's really only three things we ask, three things that you need to do. Of course, this program is 100% free. You heard it. That's right. Free. <laughs> And we are really excited to be able to talk mules and donkeys every single week. And uh, you drive the program. So the first thing that we ask is that you share your name, where you're watching from, and what the weather is like. Uh, we can, Steve and I can text back and forth. We can get on the phone. We can see each other, hang out. We can do this stuff kind of whenever we need to, whenever we want to. But you are, the, you are the person that makes this thing special each and every week. And so we want to hear from you. We want to know that you're here. Um, there is value in knowing one another's name in this uh, digital age of anonymity. Um, there is value and there is worth and there is goodness that comes from just knowing each other and being known by one another. So share your name, where you're watching from, and what the weather's like so we can see you and uh, acknowledge you. The second thing that we ask is that you share any and every mule or donkey question that you got. And you might say, well, this is pre-recorded. How are you going to answer those questions, folks? I go back and I look for those questions and we answer those in an upcoming episode. So if you've got something that you've been wanting to ask, go ahead, put it in there and we will get to it in a future episode. That means you got to be watching. And the third thing that we ask is that you share the broadcast. And boy, do you want to share today's broadcast? It's going to be an incredible story about mule adventures. And uh, matter of fact, we'll go ahead and introduce it. We've got our guest today. Uh, he's been with us before. Uh, he's the author of multiple books, uh, Too Proud to Ride a Cow, uh, The Lost Sea Expedition, uh, right now, you can go to his website, riverearth.com, and you can get a free copy of 19 Million Mule Steps. It's a beautiful, uh, just gorgeous digital ebook with all sorts of wonderful uh, photos that you are sure to enjoy. And he's got a brand new book coming out as of today, uh, Two Mules to Triumph. So we've had him on before, and I just want to say welcome back, Mr. Bernie Harberts. How's it going there, Bernie? Hey, it's great to be here. Hey, Steve. Hey, Dave. Look at that. You looking what? good today uh, with that background and you got the hat. You look like you're ready to ride as soon as we say done here. It's, it's like a real background, like trees. I'm growing the winter beard. And just so you listen, that's a nice, beautiful picture. So there's my mule Polly over here. And just so your viewers know, there's like a real fire going here. Oh, you can see that in the chimney. It's been mid 30s. So if a log rolls out, please call Steve or Dave <laughs> me and get us back on course so we don't burn the joint down. Now let's talk about <laughs> mules and mule rambling. <laughs> All of a sudden you see a news report tonight. Local man erupts forest fire during mule conversation. More at 6 p.m. <laughs> That's right. We got a president. Two years ago, we burned up 100 acres of forest. So I, I know we can go for 150 <laughs> 
my goodness. See, Bernie's calling out my background. See, my background, uh, that's fake. Bernie's saying Dave's got the fake. I've got the real deal. And I'll tell you what, I'd much rather. I, I'm actually in my bedroom at the house. I had a busy morning here, so I couldn't get out. I'm in my bedroom. This is technology. I would much rather be where you are. So uh, we're glad to have you here, man. It's really good to have you back. Of course, the last time we had you join us, uh, you had just completed or, or had recently completed a uh, – how many mi how many thousand miles was it total? Yeah, so the last time we spoke, I just completed a ride from Western North Carolina to Idaho. So 2,300 miles, seven months – two mules, brick and cracker, no support vehicle. And it was an incredible journey. Um, I learned so much about my mules, about uh, getting by with less. I didn't have a support or chase team. And one of the things I'd like to talk about is how, you know, it sounds like, wow, well, this guy went 2,300 miles across the country. Well, this is a scalable spirit. And by that, I mean, this is something that anyone who's got a horse or mule or even doesn't can tap into to some degree. And I'd really like to talk about that and how by putting our animals first, we can have these amazing voyages where everyone comes out really well, whether it's for an afternoon or a year. That's really great. Um, I'll tell you what, you, you bring up putting animals first and what that gets me thinking and folks who are new to the program, this will be the first time they've heard it, uh, but folks who watch week in and week out, you may even know what I'm already going to say. We get in our minds as humans, uh, no matter what the animal is, in this instance we're talking mules, but we get in our minds that what we find comfortable, what we find interesting, what we find uh, comforting, what we find uh, satisfying, we project that on these animals, whatever they might be. We project that on the mule and say, oh, well, you know, well, we like being around other other people and we feel terrible when we're not around other people. Mules, they we've got to have they're going to be unfulfilled if they got the other thing. Or we might think, well, I like being able to have as much food as possible. We could put our mule out there, let our mule eat as much as as much as he right. wants all day, every day. And uh you know, I, I don't want to have a rope around my, around my nose or around my neck. A mule probably doesn't want that either. But we project on them what we think is comfort as opposed to truly putting the animal first and learning what it is they find comfortable. Steve, why don't you talk to us a little bit uh, just about that? I mean, we get that all the time. Folks saying, you know, folks saying that, well, that, you know, well, that's abuse or uh, the mule's not going to be happy. Talk to us a little bit about that, Steve. Now, I think I think uh, Barney here could really give us some good ideas. You got to remember, it was just him and two mules for you know two thousand plus miles. That's absolutely incredible. And he had to he couldn't carry all of his feed and and provisions for those mules uh, just on that one pack mule, uh, right? Because it's you know all the feed and this sort of thing. So he had to be uh aware of of colic he had to be aware of uh, shoeing problems he had to be aware of, of saddle sores rain rock uh all these things that you got to maintain and see on a daily basis you know what the meal looks like and and uh you know when you go on a trip like this and you go into new country and you turn these animals loose on a pasture and you're thinking you'll be all right they're on grass to be continually changing feed uh, on a on a daily basis uh, had to be interesting. It's amazing what what I what I learned is that actual motion, moving forward steadily, 10, 15 miles a day with with my animals. We averaged we only averaged about twelve miles a day during the whole trip, like day after day. The animals never ever looked better. They don't look they don't look as near as good now after than after walking 2300 miles. And to get back to to circle back to what Dave was saying, it is so easy to project on our animals what we think feels good to them or what they need. One of my favorite cartoons is and you, you guys may have seen it is like two heavily blanketed horses. One looks at the other and said, 
my owner is always cold. That kind of sums it up. And your owner might also be overfed. So the, the, the constant motion, the, the steadily eating just enough is absolutely the, the perfect ingredient for making animals really achieve kind of the ultimate of what they could be because we're surrounded by too much in our society oh, yeah. from too many videos, too much well-intended information, too much food, too much, you know, too many blankets for a horse, too many supplements. You know, there's, there's just too much if we try to use it all. And wow. when I went out on the road with my horses, well, with my mules, brick and cracker, a road cracker, he carried about, 10 pounds of gear on the saddle in addition to me and brick carried about saying right at about 70 pounds plus the, the pack saddle. So right at around a hundred pounds, that's not a lot of gear. And so what I learned was to pick up things as I went. Um, so you'd mentioned feed, Steve, this is a real issue and, and, and we'll circle back to, the mules, the animal always comes first. And the mule really or horse or animal needs basically three things, food, water, and shelter. And I'll be happy to get into the specifics because this is really the core of what the animal needs. If it's not for that, your trip is going to be over and not in weeks, but in days. And if you're lucky enough to stay on the road for a week or two, then you got a whole other layer of things to deal with, like saddle sores, um, hoof care. And so these are some things I, I, I really learned so much about that actually apply to just my weekend trail riding now. I mean, I've learned so much that helps me just on a weekend out riding with friends. So I think it's important. How long have you been with mules? How long have you been... Working well, real quick, before he answers that, I think it's important to say Bernie is a 50 years professional veterinarian, 50 years plus professional nutritionist, 50 years plus professional equestrian, 50 years plus livestock. Like he, I think you have over 2,000 years of experience. And I'm only old. 45 years old, which is the <laughs> darn thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that's, that, it's preposterous. There's no, you, you need expertise in some of these areas and there's, it's impossible for you to be, uh, you know, professional in all of these areas. You had to gain this over time. So yeah, when did you get started with the mule? So I had, um, I worked at a corporate job until my early thirties, decided I wanted to go sailing, bought a sailboat, sailed alone around the world, sold the boat when I was 35 when I was 36, I thought, I'm going to ride a mule across North Carolina. I should have called Steve first, but I didn't. <laughs> I called Steve afterwards for help. But I bought this mule named Woody, um, took off one mule. I spent just a few weeks getting him ready, had, had zero prior long distance packing experience or anything which should give everyone hope that you can, you can do this. I had an old McClellan saddle. I, I ripped, I cut some leather into strips to make stirrup irons. I made my saddle bag, pommel bags out of horse blankets. Um, my reins were just ropes. So this should give you an idea of how little it actually takes to get going. So that was my first trip and I ended up going all the way across the United States um, with Woody and later a pack pony named Maggie, who was only about 13 too. So I, it's so important. F the point I want to get across to people is you can do these, these amazing voyages, whether they're across the country or just weekend rides with very little gear. And it's wonderful if you can get a little bit of the right gear. But the main thing is just to start. Yeah. Wow. Imagine that, Dave. He, it's almost like the uh, we used to have a term, and, and you don't hardly see it anymore because not many of them around called saddle tramp. And you know, you'd have a you'd have a cow camp going on, 
and uh, everybody's doing their job and this sort of thing. And then this one lone rider would come walk riding in from nowhere, you know, looking for a, a day job and this sort of thing. That's kind of like Bernie is doing here. Uh, he just, he just kept, he just tried things. He didn't, he just decided he was going to do it and did it. Now, a lot, a lot of people do something like that, you know. But see, uh, here, and here, and, and here's where I want to tie Steve into it to show you how this really can work out well. Like, I took off on my latest trip riding Western North Carolina to Idaho. And I, I only spent six weeks getting ready for this trip. That's not a lot of time. My animals were in shape. I only owned my saddle mule cracker for six weeks. Wow. I bought a saddle from Steve. Uh, I, it's a, one of the um, QVM. It was the trail light model. It was shipped and it was stolen yeah. from our front gate. The only thing we've ever had stolen. Steve was awful good. We, you know, we went to battle. He, Steve went to battle with a shipping company. It did, they didn't send us another saddle. Steve, Steve sends me another saddle that shows up two days before I leave on my trip. So like it's a Thursday, I put the saddle on Friday and I take off Saturday. That is not the way you break in a saddle, is it, Steve? <laughs> so, tough, yeah. but, but I took off. I did squirt some soapy water on it, like you suggested, Steve. And, and with the point I'm getting to, I just took off. And by, uh, you know, five, 600 miles into the trip, I started getting like some white spots under the saddle pad. And I put like a wool blanket up. And in Meridosha, I was getting like quarter size bald spots. And so some people at this point would be like, push on you got to push on some people be like quit and i said no i'm gonna hold up here and i'm gonna call steve and we're gonna figure this out and so steve talked me through it he said don't put that heavy wool blanket between your regular saddle pad and the saddle as i had he said because what you're doing is you're scalding which is in effect cooking your horse's back and so Steve very gratefully, uh, very graciously sent me another saddle pad, which I still have, Steve. Yeah. He gave me some techniques, which I didn't know about. And that was to every, I think it was, I did it every hour because I really took it to heart. Stop as I was riding up the road, loosen the back cinch, tip the back of the saddle up to let that hot air get out from underneath the saddle. And then I would ride another hour, and by at noon I would take the saddle off for an hour, let the horses, let the mules back dry. So that I like that story because that is the perfect arc of going from a really imperfect start. You don't start a, a trip through America of thousands of miles with a new saddle, but if you do, go slow and ask for help, and it showed up. And, and, and that was really good information from Steve that I, that I didn't know. And it kept us going, which goes to show again, that if, if folks are just ready to try, just, just try, you can, you can get through a lot of stuff. You can get through a lot of stuff. I mean, does that, does that make, does that break it down into the pieces of how, this big giant picture comes up. Wow, a guy rides, you know, 2,300 miles to the West. Well, break it up, break it up into pieces. And he did, he's got on the back here, Dave. Well, real, real quick, go ahead, hold that up there, Steve. Cause what, what are you talking about there, Steve? He's got on the back here. He has back here dates and places and distances uh, where he, how he went each day on a daily basis. What is so, that that you're holding? This is this is his new book. Hey, two mules to triumph. Okay, now it says here he left North Carolina April the sixth. He went twenty miles. Well, then April the seventh, he went ten miles. Then April the eighth, he went ten miles. April the ninth, he went ten miles. Then all of a sudden, he got a wild hair, and he's going, going through Roan Mountain, Tennessee. 15 miles, but then he took three days break. And now get this, on April the 15th, 
he went into my hometown, Irwin, Tennessee. That hung the where, elephant. That was where I was born. That was where Mary the elephant was, was I, hung, by, hung by the neck until dead. Yep. I did not know that, Steve. Yep. Amazing yep. story. Super town. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And it, Incredible. So anyway, he has listed in here his gear, uh, how much, you know, you see pictures of gear here that where he had planned it out and how to tie it on and this sort of thing. He used, I mean, he spent a lot of time figuring this. I didn't hear him. He only had a hundred hundred pounds on his pack meal. 200 pounds is what's industrial average. Okay. So a hundred pounds, he's being good to that meal. And, and he did have, you know, different things happen. For instance, right here, you can see, yep. There was a wreck. Are you <laughs> going to have wrecks? Yes, you're going to have wrecks. But let's go back to taking care of the mules. You were changing feed almost on a daily basis. Did you have any type of of uh, problems, colic or sickness or anything like that with them mules? I never. So let's talk about the food first. I never, ever had a problem with food. So at home, we feed mostly hay, you know, high roughage, a little bit of pellets, no sweet feed, um, very cool diet. Um, I get to Maridosha, Missouri, where I called you, Steve, for help. Well, the, it's been raining for weeks out there. There's no feed store around. Nobody's got horses. I walk down to the river and there's a canal, like where the barges come and load grain, corn. And I asked the guys, I said, can you, can you guys spare a little corn? And they were like, sure. And they give me like 20 pounds of corn. And these are corn samples that go on the barges. So every barge load, they take a couple pounds just to, to sample the moisture content. So I'm feeding my mules like pure straight corn, which is a hot food. You're, you're not really supposed to do this. But because they had become, they were working so hard and their, their systems had become used to a wide range of food, they would eat corn in one town. Then they would eat, you know, alfalfa pellets in the other. Sometimes I could only find a bag of sweet feed. I would give them that. They ate the whole array, the whole range of food that's available to them. But the big difference was wow. they knew when to quit eating. And they walked 80 miles a week, roughly on average. And wow. to walk, you know, to walk 15 miles a day doesn't take five hours. It takes at least eight hours by the time you saddle, unsaddle, you know, take a lunch break. So they were constantly in motion. And I think that constant motion prevented all sorts of problems with their guts. I would never dream of feeding these mules straight corn at home. Like, no, I'm not doing that on the road with them moving. It was amazing. It, it worked out. So just, and I point that out is just the incredible adaptive, uh, adaptability of mules and also horses that I've had the same experience with. Well, and, and you, you know, you you hit the button on the, hit the nail right on the head right there. Cause you said you were working these animals. They had something to do. They were going, you know, uh, yes. I, I've read where uh, during World War One, uh, where the French had actually attacked a train and the train had on it all kinds of bakery goods and they actually fed their horses bread. They just give them loaves of bread and just let them eat and eat and eat, you know, but they were busy. They had something to do. And this is a good point that I want to point out is I tell everybody that when you are increasing your amount of travel time or trail time or riding time, it's imperative that you increase your feed. Now, my favorite thing is to give whole oats. Whole oats gives energy and, yes. uh, and, and, and it doesn't suck away uh, from the muscle. It sucks away from the fat. And whole oats is a wonderful thing, but I do yes. not give them on a daily basis, maintaining. So, your mules were burning uh, that fuel 
uh, because they were constantly going, you know. And then when you did right. found pasture, when you were taking breaks where they were like three days in a row, they were in that same pasture for quite a while then, weren't they? Yes. So they got, so they also, especially back east, they got a lot of grass. Now, so just so to point over, get my directions right. So to point this side, you see behind me our mules. So we've got three mules, two horses over my shoulder. And this looks like really, really lush grass. It is, but they are only out there two to four hours per day. That's it. They do not live on lush green grass. The rest of the time, they live in a dry lot with just like a, a good rock dust footing and a run-in shed. They all live outdoors and they're super healthy. Their feet are better for it. Their minds are better for it. They're not all jacked up on sugar running around, you know, like crazy kids that have eaten Snickers bars and snow cones. Well, let's, they're let's, talk about, let's talk about the shoeing thing here. Unless you got some more to add. About the no, feet. no, that's funny. one of my did favorite subjects. Any, did you take any banamine with you or anything like that, or had to see a bed on the trip? I I did take a tube of banamine. I had one big mule crash in Brandenburg, Kentucky, and it was so bad it squished my tube of banamine all over my backpack. It looked like somebody took a like a caulking gun filled with toothpaste and shot it all over my bag, which I carried my gear in. So wow. that was it for the band. I mean, I had one pretty serious mishap where Cracker, my saddle mule, ran on his picket. Uh, he had to back up. He, I had him picketed out. And this was my mistake. He was close to a hot wire fence. He, he knows hot wire. He's been close to that before. But this time, he stuck his nose on it and got shocked. So he took off at a gallop, hit the end of the picket, I pick it by leg, and he did a flip. And it it was it was a really spectacular crash. I felt ter terrible for Cracker, and I thought, I gotta give this animal some banamine. Well, I didn't have it because it had gotten squished all over the pack and I threw the tube out. Long story short, up the road, I found a I found a, a farmer. He had horses. He gave us some banamine. It would have been better to have it there, but if you have everything that you need, you're going to need a trailer and a chase team to to haul it. Yeah. Aside from that, and one little bit of my mule cracker was sore a few days out in Wyoming, but aside from that, they were incredibly sound. Yeah. And a lot of it, I think, we'll talk about the hoof boots because this is really important. Um, I found for their overall health. So on my trip, I used hoof boots. Um, the brand I used was Renegade. I've used other hoof boots, uh, Cavallos, uh, Scoots, Easy Care products on other trips. They're all, they make some fine boots now. The, the major reason I took, well, two reasons I took hoof boots instead of steel shoes were weight. I've traveled with nail on steel shoes before, and it was just so much weight to carry the nipper, the rasp, nails, extra shoes. Um, that was 20 pounds of gear. Hoof boots, they wear them about half the time, and they're much lighter. And the other reason is I'm a lousy farrier. And so hoof boots I found much easier to use. And I think the final reason is the, the hoof boots, this is the third reason I get that, they just allow that hoof to expand and contract. You can take them off at night. I probably did a third of my trip barefoot on the front feet, which wear more, and probably half the trip barefoot, um, no hoof boots on the back feet. So there's a lot of time they went barefoot that lets the hoof expand and contract. And the hoof boot also protected the uh, hooves from a lot of the glass, wire, broken metal, screwdrivers, bottles, all the trash you see on the side of the road. So hoof boots worked out really well for me, super well. Did you use on the you, same? On you. Yeah. Did you use the same pair of hoof boots for the whole trip? 
I did. It's a little like that old joke about this is my granddaddy's axe. It's got, you know, two heads and three handles. What I did is I started off with eight hoof boots, four for each mule and two spares. As I went, the soles, like the bottom, would wear out. And on the brand that I used, uh, which is Renegade, after like maybe a thousand miles, there would you'd get a hole in the bottom of the boot. And so I would just take the boot apart and put a new sole on the boot. And you can fix most all the hoof boots now. So if someone likes one brand, you can fix those too. You see the hoof repair kit that he had there. He actually had a, a hoof boot repair kit that he had put together. Good so that little, that, they said that little, good that, good, yeah. yeah, you know, that photo you held up, Steve, all of that, that whole hoof boot repair kit could fit into a little Ziploc sandwich bag. Like, oh. you know, like the little one quart one. It, it's no amount of gear. It's just yeah. a beautiful way to do it. Wow. Well, that's great. So you're, you, you, you used uh, my riding saddle, my trail light saddle. What kind of repairs did you have to do on the saddle as you're going down the road? The, the one modification I had to, to make to the saddle was as I rode, a lot of times I would drape the lead rope around the horn as I ponied my pack mule, just to give me a little extra something to kind of break the lead rope with. I never dallied the lead rope off. That's really dangerous. You don't want to ever dally off your pack animal. But my 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 uh, pack mule brick was a little sticky, so sometimes she'd pull back, and that would run the lead rope around the front of the saddle horn. So what I did is I ended up going uh, out, and I found a uh, an inner tube, and just did the traditional wrap the inner tube around the horn a couple times. Yep. Um, and that that worked great. But I, but I will say one word of caution if for people that want to do this. Just remember that when you're ponying an animal and you've got the inner tube wrapped around your saddle horn, it is going to grip so much more than it does without. So you can get into trouble. So you really want to get a feel of how easily that rope will pull off, you know, so you don't get in a real bind. Um, the only two repairs, there's only one repair. I found I was riding up the side of the road and I would use my, I usually rode facing traffic. And so the right, the bottom, the underside of the right fender, which is uh, the outside against your leg is like a heavy uh, material, like a heavy canvas. The inside is like a padding that wore out under my leg from where I was constantly bumping the mule to stay off the road because I found the mules really wanted to walk on the highway. It's easier for oh, yeah. them to walk. They did not want to walk in the grass. So I was constantly bumping a little bit. So that right fender uh, had some wear underneath it. And the, the only thing that broke on this saddle was one of the conchos. Oh, That's the only thing that broke on the saddle after all this craziness. So oh. I got a replacement. The, go ahead. No, no, so I got a replacement concho and I kept that kind of worn out fender because I was like, this is cool. It works fine. In fact, Steve, you even offered to send me one. I was like, no, 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 no. You know, I like yeah. this worn out fender. <laughs> it <Yeah>. works fine. <laughs> <laughs> and then that pack saddle that you're using there, that's, uh, that's a pack saddle that was part of designing adjustable yeah. pack saddle. Yes. So the, the pack saddle, I got, I got the, uh, the pack saddle from you. It is uh, so for people that are not familiar with this, uh, when we think of pack saddles, most people think of like a sawbuck. It's like a wooden X, two wooden X's. And then you've got the bars, which are the, the flat pieces that go against the mules or horses back. That is all a fixed system. The, uh, the pack saddle you helped design, Steve, just explain to readers those those bars. First of all, they swivel so they will fit the 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 animals back better. You can get different shaped bars to fit the the curve of the animals back better. 
And then the cross tree, which is like the X is adjustable. So these are, you know, adjustments you can make to really make that one saddle fit different kinds of animals, different kinds of, you know, situations. Yeah. Absolute total breakthrough in, in pack saddles. And, and was- we're talking about, you know, I was just going to say to come back to the animal, it has saved so many sore backs on our pack animals. The pack animal, unfortunately, a lot of people are like, oh, that's just a pack mule. No, that is a really important member of your team. And you, and you really should take every bit of good care of that animal's back and everything else as your saddle mule. Yeah. So, yeah. But that's how you, that adjustable pack saddle is how I figured out the angles of my riding saddle, what angle I was going to be. Because, you know, obviously, as, as you ride them, they start thinning down, toughening up. And so, that's right. so I thought I had to keep changing the angles, but I didn't have to. Once I started seeing how consistent one mule was in a particular angle, I left it alone. And then after right. all those years, I started seeing they were really consistent at one particular angle. So that pack saddle helped me out a lot in in, in designing the riding saddle. Well, currently, Very cool. I didn't know that. it's so like served on, almost like a model for the for the saddle. On the it's a great saddle. design, by the way. On the except side. Steve. Yeah, I was just going to say, Steve. I, I will warn you and your readers. Like, what's the first photo in the Trash to Triumph book? It's a photo of the pack saddle hanging off the side of the mule, and under that it says, "Caution: This is not an instruction manual." <laughs> Operator uh, error, operator error. Other thing you've got to think pack. about, folks, is that when he, uh, hey, Dave, go ahead and tell him what you're going to tell him about the pack saddle. Well, I was going to say is, so what you had said, Steve, is you used that pack saddle um, to determine the angles for the riding saddle. And for years, that pack saddle, that adjustable pack saddle was available. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, what we discovered was that, well, in the same way that we use that pack saddle to find the angle that the pack that the saddle was consistently sitting at, the pack saddle is now gone to a wooden design, but it is got the bars at the optimal position, just like we have with the riding saddle. And uh, on MuleRanch.com, we no longer sell the pack saddle. We refer folks to uh, Mountain Ridge Gear and Eric Lynn at Mountain Ridge Gear is selling sure. Steve's designed. Um, Steve's design pack saddle in an all wooden model. And I'll show right here. Um, Very cool. Very right cool. there. This is, this is what it is now because it lays at the same angle across the board. I mean, it, it, and if you look at the bar right here, this is the same angle. Correct me if I'm wrong, Steve, but this is the yeah. same angle and this is the same placement that the riding saddle bars are at. And so over time, we discovered. Hey, the adjustment is fine, but you really don't need the adjustment so much as you need it to sit where it would naturally lay. And so what you're seeing here is a um, a, a version of the bars, wooden bars here, uh, that you would get in the riding saddle. Correct, Steve? Right. Exactly. Exactly. So it's, it's, it's really, you know, time has changed. Uh, when I was looking for answers over the years, uh, you know, here, here's Barney. Uh, you know, he looked for answers. He stri- tried to school hard knocks. It just resembles resembles all the stuff that I went through trying to figure out. And like Barney kept saying, what's best for my animal? Right. What's the best for my animal? And that is right. what's really important here. And so using using that pack saddle was designed it is what made the difference in it. You know, so it you talk, difference. talk about yeah. animals coming first. You talk about what that means. We we talked a little bit about the gear, but really you said in the beginning, it comes down to food, water, and shelter. Those yeah. are really the three things you need. I'd like to hear a little bit about how you're doing 10 miles, 10 miles, 10 miles, 15 miles. How are you planning that out to make sure that the animal is coming first with the food, the water, and the shelter? And I would imagine, and, and I think I'll just add to this, you're saying, well, I'll stop after an hour and I'll give the animal a break. And I think that's another way that the animal comes first. You don't just plow through your your roof for the day. You got to stop and take time. Would you 
go into a little bit further detail because I'm interested and I'm not even an equestrian. So if I'm interested, there are people watching right now who are interested in that. So the way I would maybe break it down is maybe Eastern riding versus out West. So you, you see behind me, like it's where it's a really lush area. There's grass around. So like a typical morning, let's say I started from scratch. I was staying, I was at someone's house that stayed the night before. I would, uh, maybe if they had a little grain from the local feed store, I would give them that. And then I would take off uh, riding. After, by noon, four hours would be about the max I would want to ride. That's the absolute max I want to ride. At noon, I take off the saddle. Um, I will pick them out on the side of the road by a leg. I've got a short rope that I pick it on. That lets the horse or, or mule graze for about half an hour. I notice after about a half an hour, they just kind of, their, their bellies are filled. Half an hour, 45 minutes. That's enough time for me to take a nap, which is very important. Eat a sandwich. If there's water around, let them have a drink of water. Usually there's not because on these long rides I do, you're following roads. So you're going to be camp beside a road or in a park but you probably won't find water at lunch half the time. So then uh, you might come by a creek, let him get something to drink. That evening, I would I would look for, if I was heading into a community, um, I would knock on, on someone's door. Um, let's say I was coming into a place called uh, Taswell, Tennessee. Real place, real evening. I looked over, I see a barn down there, and I've already scoped it out. There's a barn, there's a pasture, and I think this would be a good place to potentially spend the night. I ride over, meet a guy named Danny Coffey, who owns the place, super guy. He said, sure, spend the night. He puts the mules out in his pasture, and then I spend another day, we get some grain from the feed store. And so you can see how I kind of out east, am able to find Plenty of grass, you know, to eat. Places are close enough that you can find homes, farms to stay at, and there are feed stores around. Mm. Out west, this this really changes because let's say you're now in Wyoming, and let's say I'm riding um, from uh, Sweetwater Junction, which is out way out in Wyoming to atlantic city not new jersey atlantic city wyoming it's and i'm just throwing a number here it's like 40 miles away through the desert along single cart pass and, and roads gravel roads there's no water out there so in that case what i did is in sweetwater station i was camped there beside a river i let the um the mules drink out of the river the sweetwater river there was grass for them to eat, but I didn't have grain, but there was enough grass for them to get by. A group of Mormons invited me for supper that night, and they're like, well, you know, we own a we own a camp about 20 miles from here. It's called Sage Camp. You could stay there. And they said, there's a there's a like a little pond there. So I go 20 miles across the desert through the sagebrush, very little for the mules to eat. We get to Sage Camp. There's a corral there. Um, there's just enough grass for the mules to eat. And the pond, unfortunately, is pretty murky water. But my mules, they're kind of like dogs that want to drink out of toilets instead of like the dog dish, the dog bowl. They, they like drinking out of puddles. So they're fine with it. They drink this water that's not perfectly clear. And then the next day, we head off about 20 more miles to Atlantic City, um, where I go to a bar, find a place to stay in town. They've got, uh, I meet a woman who's got horses. She gives me alfalfa, hay and grain. We're camped right next to a river. And so the horses, the mules again can drink and eat grass. But these are two different scenarios. Like out west, the distances just get bigger. 
So you really have to think about that a wow. little harder than out here. So wow. no, no chasing. We didn't have a, a water wagon or anything running yeah. ahead of us. So I, I remember I about some of the 1860s when guys were heading out west and the the horses were so hungry, they actually ate grasshoppers. And, oh, yeah. Can you imagine? They actually ate grasshoppers. And a couple of guys did lose their horses. They did colic uh, and die. Uh, but they, well, they were yeah, so hungry. They just ate anything. And the grasshoppers is one of the things that they ate. So well, those grasshoppers were covered in chocolate. That could have made all the I difference. Can I, was so was so hungry a couple of times on my trip. I was yeah. so hungry on my trip a couple of times. I was ready to eat grasshoppers. <laughs> there's this Dallas. scene there's this scene in this movie dumb and dumber they're riding down the road on this little little mini dirt bike they pull into aspen colorado he goes man you hungry no nah, i'm good i swallowed a big june bug about three miles back you're like oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't lots of exercise exercise you'll be all right make him walk don't think that he had it easy you see this oh geez <laughs> you know can you imagine going over that bridge all that <sighs> traffic and what, what, what was it, 100 feet off the side of that thing, Barney? Now, what yeah, I want to point out real quick before he says that, you trained for this. You you desensitized. You went through all of this stuff. You have a bridge in your backyard, right? With yes. with major with traffic going joint. through. I've got semis going both ways over it. Yeah, it's clear. Oh, yeah. I, I can see it's it. 100 feet it's above the you it's were able 100. to desensitize. The mule knew exactly what to expect. Oh yeah, like these obstacle course. <laughs> this my obstacle course will will prepare you for any cross country adventure. <laughs> didn't have any of that. I'm being facetious for those who can't tell. Talk to us about that a little bit. So there's a lot of improvising, and and there's no there's no beating a good foundation for taking off on a long trip like this. And so I did probably not as much as I should have with my mules to take off on this big trip. But one thing like one of the biggest challenges aside from just road riding, which is just, I mean, there were literally thousands of horse of, of cars driving by us every day. Um, and just to give you a feeling of what that's like, riding through Appalachia, which is where we live, uh, Western North Carolina, Tennessee, Kentucky, in many cases, I actually rode with traffic, which is not the way you're supposed to do it for the simple fact that I found my mules reacted better when a tractor trailer came up behind them and they didn't see it. Or maybe it was just me, you know, being not as freaked out. But you've got a tractor trailer pulling a 40 foot trailer. This thing could weigh 50,000 pounds and it's going 65 miles an hour. You hear it come up behind you. There's this roar. Vroom, and as it wow. goes by you, it blows you and your mule and your pack mule sideways. Everything shifts sideways off the road as that goes by. It is deafening. The tractor trailer roars by you. And as the back of the trailer passes you, it sucks you into the road, sucks you the other way. Like, how do you prepare for that? You, you do your best is what you do. And so the, the, one of the other challenges I found were these bridges. Um, coming into Brandenburg, Kentucky, uh, I knew I had to cross the Ohio River, which is the second largest river in the continental US after the Mississippi. And I walked down to the river to take a look. Uh, actually, a woman that I stayed with, uh, her family, um, uh, Tracy Lynette Smallwood, got to give a shout out to her. She and her husband, Robbie, put me up. They walked me down. I look at it and I'm looking up the Ohio River, standing on the bank. And it looks like I'm on, on the banks of a lake that's going sideways, a big lake, almost like a, an impoundment. I, I'm just not sure how I'm going to get across this. We go back to Tracy Lynette Smallwoods. There's a police cruiser in her driveway because the neighbors have called the cops on my mules and Tracy. And I explain, you know, she explains he's had permission. Bernie's had permissions. The mules are okay. 
and the 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 officer turned out to be the chief of police um i think it was captain haig of and, and i apologize captain forget your name wrong of Shout Brandenburg. Out to captain haig yeah and the escort he ended up giving me a police escort out across the bridge and as i rode out onto this bridge i thought my gosh like we're so high up that thing that looked like a a, a river uh, like a lake going sideways in front of me the day before it looked like the trickle coming out of a garden hose it was so far down and so he turns on the blue lights we trot out on the bridge mm. it is just deafening the sound of all the gear on the it's the pack saddle clink 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 all the the pickets and the the ropes and the the your gear your your bivy bag and we come to what i think is an expansion joint like these big metal fingers on the bridge and i'm like i've had some trouble with this on my you know a few weeks before the mules freeze up leap over it and it's just a shadow from the girders that this bridge is made of well, we get across, finally get across the bridge. Before we get to the other side, people are passing all the people we've backed up. Not only me, and not only Brick and Cracker, but Captain Haig, chief of the Brandenburg Police Department, because they can't get by as fast enough. Like that's how impatient people are. And that's what you have to deal with. There's the video, look at that. Holy smoke. <laughs> On a film, it, by the way. Oh, that's beautiful. Okay, that's now, crazy you, okay folks now, do you hear what he's saying here how can you prepare for a trip you can't now this is this is not just a trip that just anybody go and do 2300 miles my goodness so can you imagine just preparing for a weekend going nice little trail riding maybe eight ten hours preparation folks you cannot desensitize these mules to everything now, I want you to know that uh, on top of this, now you see what all he's going through here? This is incredible. Now, Barney, notice the hat that's on the back of the pack mule, his top hat. You know what he's wearing? He's wearing a helmet. You hear that? You see the pack, you see that top hat? That top hat is on the pack mule. This man don't want to be on the side of the road with his head split open and nobody around folks things like this here is what you if you really want things to know that you need to do you a helmet that is extremely important i mean it's you know it, yeah. it looks good cool to have a cowboy out yeah we're cowboys yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm yep. yeah yeah yep. Okay. Yep. i got mine on yeah yeah and and he earned that hat you know mine's from australia um anyway <laughs> that's another story but, but i want to jump in I want to jump in really quickly if we have time yeah. and let's talk about this helmet thing real quickly because it is so important and, and there's the and steve you put a great you put a kind of a great spin or you captured the essence of like well i'm a cowboy i wear a cowboy hat and i'm tough and you know i'm sitting on this horse and i got my hat on i suffer from the same thing because like there's this perception that hats aren't cool, but you know, what's not cool is falling off your mule, busting your head open, splitting your brain being, you know, turning to a vegetable and having your family take care of you. Like that's a real issue. And it happened to me and I'm not going to, it's in the book. I was thrown off a seasoned mule in Brandenburg, Kentucky. I hit my head so hard it broke my helmet in three pieces landed right here on my oh. temple the thinnest part of your skull wow and if i'd been wearing this good looking hat i would not have finished the trip and worse my wife julia would have been burdened with taking care of a of a seriously incapacitated person so i resist the pressure to look cool and wear a hat when I'm out right. I wear my helmet on the trail. It's a totally perfect, it's a personal decision. I, I really get that. But for any of you listeners who, who think, am I the only one this may, you know, the thinks this makes me look like a gimbo? You're not. I wear a helmet. 
Too bad. <sighs> hey, now there's a there's a buckaroo there. There you we can, go. Uh, you can find a helmet yeah. that works for you. And so little yeah. Stevie right here found a helmet that worked for him. Y'all yeah. can find helmets that work for you too. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And it's so, totally I'm totally cool with that. So, so folks, that, you know, that's my helmet. We, yeah, feel. we can talk for hours about Barney's trip here, but I, I'm telling you, I, I've I, I got so infatuated with the book, and I'm not a reader, but I I'm I'm on page two fourteen, and I actually read read that in about three hours, four hours. Uh, I was just amazed and looking at the pictures as well. But he's got things in here like how fast does a mule walk? You know, he talks about Independence Rock. I mean, he's gone through all kinds of, of things, uh, learning by the School of Hard Knocks, all right? And and that's exactly what he learned. But also, you know, he was able to call me, folks. And Barney will tell you, if you call me, I'm going to give you some suggestions, yeah. like lifting up the back of that saddle. Once you've scalded that back, you got to be really careful. You go put wool on there, it scalds it even worse. So once you got rid of the wool and you started raising it up and down and cooling off the back some, that really worked good, didn't it? It worked super. It it, it was a kind of a game changer. And the other thing I, I want to mention, I did a tremendous amount of walking. And I'm not the only long rider. So a long rider is a person that's ridden like a continuous trip of over a thousand miles. So many of these people, whether it's the, the amazing lady long rider, Bernice Endy, or Philippe Massetti Laite, who, who's ridden across North and South America, a lot of the, everyone, I'm going to say everyone leads their saddle horse a lot. So I led my horse or my mule cracker probably a third of the trip just to save his back. Animal comes first. Yeah. If you, if, if you're on a saddle voyage and you consider yourself a rider, you're going to walk your, your mount, just like they used to in the cavalry, incidentally. Yep. So, yep. Yep. Folks. And, folks. And here, here's the key thing, folks. You know, he did some preparation, but how many, how many hundreds of hours do you think you'd have to prepare for a trip like this? It's going to take you days and hours up on top of hours. You know, it, it's amazing. So I'm, uh, you, you guys, you, you got to get this book. You got to read it. It's a uh, hold up the a, cover there, Steve. The, yeah. the book is two mules to triumph. It's a long ride through the heart of America. Y'all go to riverearth.com and there is a option there underneath the menu. There's an option to sign up for the newsletter. I'm going to put that link in the show description. Y'all can go sign up for the newsletter You'll get an alert when the book goes on sale, but you're also going to get 19 million mule steps. And it is I'm just... hold that up for you right now, quick. Yep, he's got it right there, so let's have him hold. You're going to get 19 million mule steps, which is just a gorgeous digital ebook. It's going to come to you right away, riverearth.com. Sign up for the newsletter, and you're going to get all of these pictures uh, that Bernie has collected over the years. Now, if you go to riverearth.com, you could click through the thousands of posts, hundreds, thousands of posts. Or you could just sign up for the newsletter and have them delivered all to you in one book together. I know which one I would do. Uh, Bernie, we would love uh, to have you back uh, sometime in the future just to talk about what your next adventures are. But is there anything you want to say here before we're all done today? Let's do it. I think I think everyone out there who's listening, who's got just a smidgen of a dream of what they want to do with their mule, their horse, or their animal, whatever, you should really take that seriously and just start. If, you, if you're dreaming of taking you know, riding across America with your mule and you, you're just not sure about it, go for a weekend ride, go to a state park, go out with friends, go to a friend's place. If you need to, to, to tie your, if you need to camp in your friend's backyard or his barnyard just to get through that first night, I would really recommend everyone, please do that just to get started. Once you have momentum, that's the, that's the secret and do take good care of your animals and they'll, they'll help you keep that momentum going.
Yeah, we talk about it all the time. A mule will give his life for you if you just take good care of him. Steve, anything you want to say before we're all done here? No, I'm going to tell you that, uh, like you can see in this picture here, you can see a frozen mule and a frozen Bernie. And, <laughs> and, and, and it didn't make any difference. Uh, hot, cold, everything. Bernie had a dream. And uh, he, he, he left that. He lived that dream. And he, and he learned from the, from the other times that he had. And now he's, he made it even better. Was it tough? Absolutely. He's got some times in there that I was laughing. And there's some times in that book where I was, where I was crying with him because I've been there, done that. And so I'm, I really appreciate Bernie putting together this book and then calling me up and saying, Hey, Steve, uh, can we talk about it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is, this is what folks this is what you got to understand when you got a dream, go, you know, go put it together. These mules take you away from life that we don't want to know about that we ever live in on a daily basis. And it puts you into a world that says, Hey, slow down. Did you see that grasshopper eating the other grasshopper? Did you actually see a bird hanging from a piece of barbed wire? You know, I mean, it's things that you will, that takes you away from everyday city life. And these mules kind of gives you back a whole new life. So it's pretty neat. Barney, thanks for sharing this with us. Uh, folks, when this, uh, hey, when this book becomes available, you need to get going and get one. Folks, thanks so much for hanging out. The book, Two Mules to Triumph, A Long Ride Through the Heart of America, riverearth.com. Get signed up for the newsletter. You'll get the free copy of 19 Million Mule Steps. That will keep you busy. That'll take. If you can't get out there and do it yourself right now, by golly, go on the journey with Bernie Hey, there you go. Journey with Bernie. Yeah, travel hey, hey, with Bernie Harbert. <laughs> You're right go in the on, introduction. <laughs> <laughs> go on the journey with Bernie and let him take you through the adventure that he's gotten to live and start dreaming for yourself. Folks, thank you so much for hanging out with us. God bless. Take care. And we will see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.